Next, we are going to uh, uh, give the floor to each uh, participant to the round table uh, to say a few words about uh, the experience in their country or in their organization, if they represent an organization, about uh, women particip participation in the uh, decision making uh, uh, politic in, genera in, ge in general. And uh, I hope that we are going to have a lot of lesson and recommendation uh, about this important uh, subject. So, uh, we have <laughs> It's uh, impossible in 10 <laughs> minutes to give the floor to 10 persons no. and to leave the place to the... So uh, I know that women can, uh, can uh, do all the challenges, but uh, this one <laughs> is... Uh, uh, however, I think that uh, if we take uh, two, two minutes for uh, two, two, three minutes for everyone, but we uh, try to focus on the, on the women representation and uh, uh, some ideas, some specific ideas, some uh, experiences in each of your countries about uh, our organization, about women representation in the political life. Uh, I give you the first uh, one, <laughs> because you... Uh, positive discrimination Hello. for men. Okay. <laughs> yes, I shall try to be very brief, uh, trying to fit my country, Iceland, into the statistics we have seen here. Uh, we have in Parliament uh, just under 40% uh, women's representation, but the President is a woman, the Prime Minister is a woman, Half the government are women. The newly elected bishop in Iceland is a woman. So not everything is uh, lost, but I took notice of what you said yesterday uh, in your talk, that uh, when we look at statistics uh, and look at uh, bodily harm or death uh, caused in the world, uh, there is there is more to be uh, there is more due to violence in the home violence uh, to women than from malaria wars and traffic accidents combined together. together so when we look at women's rights we must look at what we are doing in, the, in this respect and uh, our government which is a, a government of uh, social democrats and uh, socialists uh, my party is the left uh, Green Party. We have been trying to work in this field, you know, to strengthen uh, the legal framework uh, to protect the uh, victims of violence in the home. Finished. Less than ten mi two minutes. <laughs> Yeah, probably. There is another one here. Oh, there is another one. Okay, then I don't. Thank you very much. First of all, congratulations, Excellency. Amazing, amazing. I mean. Those who were not present yesterday, would you like to introduce yourself in one word? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, um, my name is Katalin Bojai. I'm the ambassador of Hungary in UNESCO. But I'm here in my capacity as the president of the General Conference, which you may know is the supreme body of UNESCO. So I'm talking here on behalf of this organization, and I'm very happy to say that uh, this is one of the organizations within the UN system which is really led by three women. So um, president of the General Conference would be me. Uh, the second uh, body uh, which governs uh, UNESCO is the so-called executive board, which is led by a lady, a, bar a lady from Barbados, who is the director of the National Museum in Barbados, and uh, the head of the organization who leads the secretariat, the director general, is Irina Bokova. And that's the very first time, actually, in history that UNESCO is led 
uh, as a, uh, uh, by a woman, Irina Bokova, and this is also the first time in history that all the three bodies are led by women. So uh, that sounds really good, and also um, we have the so-called mid-term strategy within UNESCO, and we have got two priorities. One priority, as I said yesterday, is Africa, and the other priority is uh, gender equality. So obviously we uh, have to be very conscious uh, about that, having these priorities, so we have to act ourselves according to that as well, meaning uh, the high level management in UNESCO is um, uh, also led uh, by women and men together 50-50. So um, uh, the assistant director generals, for example, for science, for social sciences, for the underwater heritage are also women. So within the organization, I think we can work uh, in, a, in a very positive way according to this topic. And there is also an interesting uh, feeling in the house because somehow the ambassadors in UNESCO are very often women. It's probably because it is a house of the soft power, which I said yesterday is not so soft, actually. But uh, somehow the percentage of the ambassadors um, at UNESCO is also very close to 50-50. I would say 60-40 still. Uh, but what I would like to stress is that as one of the priorities in US UNESCO is gender equality, we are, of course, uh, doing a lot of courses we have got pilot projects, probably I can say later on a few words about that, if you have got some time. Anyway, mainly in Africa in the, and in the developing world. Uh, we are doing a lot of capacity building in leadership uh, abilities and also um, what is very important for us that we truly believe that the role of women in conflict resolution and conflict solution would be honored and used better. And here I would like to come to my point. This is what, uh, what I'm advocating all the time on every uh, level and possibilities, that within the UN system, there is now, which is good, a good uh, part of our work, it's called the UN Women, led by previous president of Chile, Ms. Bachelet, so, and she's also a, a deputy secretary general of Mr. Ban Ki-moon but there was not one peace talk led by a woman. And I'm very strongly advocating for using the abilities and knowledge and talent of the women in peace talks, because interestingly enough, less than 8% of the members of these peace talk panels within the UN system, and less than 3% of the signatories of the peace talks were women but never led by a woman. And I would like to see a world where we can also use these special abilities um, in, in the international peace talk process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Mireya Agüero de Corrales. I am the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Honduras. And uh, as my predecessor said, I, I am not uh, very fond of uh, statistics, but I think if you have two minutes, probably uh, statistics talk for themselves. But in a way, I, I have some reserves about how uh, stati uh, statistics tell, tell you uh, the true story. A anyway, um, if I take the three indicators of the Millennium Development Goals in Honduras, it, as far as education goes, in the past five years, the participation of women in, edu in education has raised 13%. The employment um, rate has risen in 28%. And as far as political participation, I can tell you that we have, at the present, one women vice president, 20% members in Congress, 13% participated in local governments, 50% of our Supreme Courts are women, 49% in the Executive Cabinet are women, 
60% of the vice ministers are women. And we have, for next year, our first presidential candidate ever. I just have to, to, to make two comments. First, that, that in Honduras, it's not that I am opposed to quotas. Some of my predecessors talk about quotas, and quotas, and from the point of view of Sedol, are very important. You said uh, something that really struck me, that in many countries, Sedol was a low priority issue. To tell you the truth, in Honduras, it had been. But uh, we have had a great debate because we're about to ratify the optional protocol. So this has come to be a political issue in the past few months. Uh, but quotas, you know, sometimes I perceive them in Honduras as a way of talking instead of a legitimate representation tool. So uh, to me, the most important thing at this point is how do we convert this quota system, and that goes beyond as this token. And the other thing is that uh, for us, more than a glass ceiling, it is a problem still of the division of labor in Honduras. Women, as far as they participate in politics and labor and in every area of life, continue to bear the main burden of domestic work. So that can be a very difficult thing to do, and I can tell you from my own experience, I have four children, and sometimes, well, not today, but sometimes I'm asked, while I'm all over the world, where is the can of beans that you were supposed to buy, mom? And things like that. So uh, this, is, this, this is very real for women, I think, in any part of the world. My name is Ekat Rachel Ashwili, so I'm the only... Okay, so my name is Ekat Rachel Ashwili. I'm the only one who can pronounce my last name, I guess, here. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm currently the president of Georgian Institute for Strategic Studies, but then up to recently I've been the vice prime minister of Georgia, minister for reintegration, foreign minister, prosecutor general, minister of justice. I'm not fond of sort of... Uh, uh, listing my previous um, positions, but I thought in this panel that was a bit illustrative to the, to the theme that we're talking about when we speak about the women participation and the politics. And on the example of Georgia, I'll, I'll, I won't touch the statistics in that sense and then what role they could play in terms of uh, reflecting on the reality, but then uh, more on the perception side of that. Uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, women's role in the politics was very limited initially, and then that was a legacy of the, of the Soviet past, so to say, in that sense, and then beginning of the new process of building up the statehood. But then we've reached the point where I guess the cliches have been broken, and that's an important factor when we speak about what is the role actually that women play in the politics. And it's not the numbers only, obviously, they do matter. They are indicators, they are sort of set goals where the country could be moving, and then culturally the politics as well. But then how much perceptions and cliches, what a woman can do actually are broken in that respect. So in that sense, uh, how many role model women we can have in each society that can be breaking those cliches or be assisted in that, or being brave enough of doing that, that's always an encouraging factor in any society, especially in the young countries like Georgia, not historically young, but then in terms of the current democracy uh, developments in that sense. Uh, to give some, some examples from my own personal experiences in that sense, we've never had in our country uh, previously, until me doing that, let's say, being a prosecutor general in the country, that it has been poorly manly job, uh, being uh, poorly manly in that sense, in the way we want to do that, Minister of Justice or being uh, in high positions in the Ministry of Interior. There were certain uh, distinctions in politics, what women were supposed to do and then what not in that dimension. And I'm very glad that there are no divisions of that type that we, we have any more at least of having the boundaries that I set out there for the young uh, women right now coming up in the politics in Georgia of having their horizon being limited in their ambition and their motivation and dedication to their future. We've had the Speaker of the Parliament in Georgia, 
we've never had a woman president or prime minister, so there's still a lot that could be done in that dimension. So my key message here would be that uh, substantive part of what women can do actually in the politics, how far reaching their role could be in decision making policies when it comes to the overall strategic development of the country, real policy making decisions at the high layer of the, of the policies and foreign or internal policies of the country and actually taking big portion of responsibility when it comes to actual implementation of those policies. So they are accountable as well, obviously, when it comes to the electorate and society on how they deliver, that raises the expectation what women can do. And just to finish, not to be sort of long and exploitative to the time that we have in a limited way, education is extremely important. How, f how equal in the family resources are distributed between girls and boys when choices and options are for their education are being decided upon. And I'm proud that in Georgia it's a completely equal approach to that because that's where everything starts in terms of cultural perceptions and then, then actual possibilities for the realization of the personal capacities of, of children if within the limited economic resources of the families and the countries which are not rich or very well developed, the dominant factor is to give better education if choices need to be made to the boys rather than to the girls, uh, then that's where the limitation of their uh, possibilities start, obviously. And division of labor, that's a huge factor. I'm, 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 uh, myself have two children, they are small, five and two. So sometimes it's miraculous how I do what I do. But I think that that all comes with the family support and then better understanding in a society how we are equal in terms of sharing the burden on that. And um, cultural changes there as well. Uh, encouraging factor in the way how more we can do as the women by, by doing it, but at the same time being good and responsible moms too, because that's something that is needed for the future of society, being the ones who are producing second half of the <laughs> uh, population as well. So um, thank you for your attention. Financial crisis, uh, starting from the States and then in Europe and uh, spreading all over, uh, gambling with other people's money, whether if more women were around in the uh, decision-making boards of the banks, uh, things would have been different. Uh, because the main issue is that we need a synthesis of use when decisions are being taken, whether in business uh, or in uh, politics. And if only half of the population is there deciding uh, for all, then uh, the decisions cannot be as wise as they could have been if everybody was being represented. It's very simple. And it's not very democratic also to have half uh, of the population uh, deciding for everybody. I would agree with those friends who said that quotas are needed. Yes, quotas are not a perfect system. It's, it's um, uh, a policy of positive discrimination which is needed for the beginning until women are given the opportunity to demonstrate that they can do it. Yes, it is dangerous that not the best women may come around, but at least some of them will be given the chance. And um, we need also to exercise pressure that those active women are promoted so that, you know, because we have this uh, phenomenon, many countries appoint women, at least in governments. But sometimes we see that it is women who uh, will tend to agree with what the rest is say are saying. Uh, and if a woman comes out saying something different than what the majority is saying, then everybody says she's crazy. But if we have men arguing between them and fighting between them about an issue, then that is considered normality. So we need to change the education system, uh, not just teaching the children the right thing, we have to teach the teachers uh, to teach uh, the right thing. I mean, it's throughout, we need to change the political system with quotas. Yes, the least system uh, can really help, and then parties are then responsible to uh, choose those women who can really bring forward um, uh, change. And uh, mass media, we have to uh, give a way of uh, a participation of women in mass media so that they are given the opportunity to voice uh, their views. 
uh, and uh, prevent uh, the mass media uh, from uh, uh, entrenching uh, stereotypes. And we have to develop a culture of uh, peace and uh, communication, not of confrontation. And this is a challenge that should be addressed to uh, both men and women, at least for the sake of our children. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ferdos Sara Begum, former member of the UN CEDAW committee. And I worked for my government for about 32 years. I was the first women commissioner of taxes in, the, in my country, and also first women uh, director general of Bangladesh television. So when I have joined in my service in, in 1977, at that time, not many women are in the civil service. And what happened first when I have, I mean, I reported to my office, my PA refused to take dictation from me, and he was so much ashamed that uh, he got a lady boss. <laughs> but nowadays, you know, things have been changed. And another very interesting story I can tell you, um, uh, since I joined in the uh, taxation service as assistant commissioner of taxes, so many barristers and chartered accountants, they used to uh, come to me, my office, to represent their clients. And one gentleman asked me, tell me how um, uh, we should address you. As appa means sister, or as madam, or as sir. He actually asked me in a very sarcastic way. And uh, uh, readily, you know, I have got the answer. I was, I was a very young lady at that time. And I said, you know, you are addressing to the chair. And chair it represents the godly power. It's gender neutral. You must address me as sir. <laughs> and since then, <laughs> in my country, in the taxation service, in many other uh, services, women also are addressed as sir. <laughs> <laughs> and in my country, you know, um, I already mentioned our, uh, I mean, prime minister and opposition leader, both are women. Um, uh, the, uh, they are the, uh, ever since uh, one and a half decade. And uh, there are about four ministers that are there, very important ministers. Um, I mean, the foreign minister, home minister, um, uh, minister for agriculture, they are women. And we have quota in the parliament and also in the civil service. But uh, in the civil service, implementation quota is a problem uh, because we don't see that 10% quota is implemented all the time. And uh, our education system, you know, the two women uh, are in the top position. Education, we have already achieved parity in primary and uh, tertiary level. But after that, it's a problem women, uh, I mean the early marriage are there and uh, they get pregnant, they get out of the school and college. That is a big problem for women's empowerment because education is the cornerstone for empower empowerment of women. And, um, and our, you have heard about Dr. Muhammad Yunus, uh, he introduced microcredit. In my country, microcredit created a tremendous um, improvement in the life of women in the countryside. And, I mean, most of the women, they are doing small business, you know, they are independent. I mean, uh, now they can buy their own land, they can buy their own house, and uh, they can have power in their own family. And um, I mean, they have uh, the decision uh, how many children they can take, and also, I mean, whether, um, I mean, their children, I mean, will get higher education or not, because they are contributing in the way. But still, there are so many problems about violence, about trafficking, and uh, on the top of that, the poverty, because our country is a densely populated country, and 160 million people are there. But um, I mean, this is a great problem. But um, uh, regarding the, all over the world, you know, the CEDO, uh, um, actually, CEDO uh, Convention is for to implement uh, universal, uh, I mean, uh, equality for um, all over the um, uh, I'm, uh, all over the world. So implementation of quota is a very important issue. 
and I think that all the, all of the 187 countries that are party to the um, uh, parties to the uh, convention, they used to report to the um, I mean the committee every four years. Um, so I mean they are accountable um, uh, to the committee to I mean um, uh, to uh, I mean to improve the situation of women in their own country, what they are doing. It is all the time, you know, the committee, uh, through the NGOs, through the work of the UN organizations, uh, they're working in their own country, uh, in the individual country, they are reporting to the committee. And re uh, during the, I mean, you have all faced, I, I remember <coughs> you also, when I was the member, you just show, had shown that picture, actually, Countries, uh, I mean, pseudo committee in the concluding observations, they put some <laughs> recommendations, and that those recommendations are mandatory for the, the I mean, I mean um, uh, countries who ratified pseudo um, uh, to implement and what they are doing. The countries, uh, I mean, need to. This is the, uh, I mean, state obligation. When the country ratifies any of the, uh, especially pseudo, it is the state obligation to implement the concluding observations. So I am very much hopeful that um, uh, within, I mean, um, uh, I mean, uh, within a short period of, uh, period of time, we'll achieve parity in the uh, public and political field too, because you know that UN already has, uh, already has given just 30, 30, 30. That is 30 percent, uh, I mean, um, um, achievement in 2030. Of, um, uh, of women's uh, empowerment in the pol public and political arena. So I, I am concluding my speech, uh, uh, I mean, uh, quoting Bob Marley from Jamaica, uh, <laughs> that is <laughs> his great song, that is stand up and uh, um, I mean, fight f for your own right. So <laughs> we, we are women, we will fight for our own right, we will never give up. Thank you. So that is very encouraging indeed. So my name is uh, Christina Euland and um, I'm from Estonia. I've been in uh, politics 20 years since I uh, ran the first uh, democratic parliamentary elections after the restoration independence uh, in my country. But currently, and I've served as a foreign minister of my country when uh, we negotiated uh, the accession uh, to the European Union and, and NATO. So, but currently I'm a member of European Parliament last three years and therefore I prepared a little bit uh, um, more comprehensive and, and European view on uh, the situation of, uh, of, of women in, in politics. This is the history simply, you can see that uh, Iceland I'm, I'm, I'm afraid is missing from there because as long as uh, not yet Iceland is a member of the European Union but hopefully they will <laughs> join the club <laughs> in coming times. This is the, yes, the slide shows that uh, in which decades uh, women started to participate in politics in, in several EU countries and maybe some uh, uh, figures are quite um, uh, interesting and impressive. So, uh, no, uh, yes, now, yes. Now, now this, uh, this uh, I, I made it, yes, thanks. Uh, this slide, I simply chose, uh, well, uh, different, uh, smaller, bigger numbers, but the average percentage of women still is around 20% uh, in the parliaments, in the, in the national parliaments, and uh, this comes also to my country. It's 21% it's, um, in the moment without any quotas. We don't have quotas in Estonia and, and personally, as a liberal politician, I don't support the quota system. Um, well, uh, this is, uh, yes, this is the um, uh, development uh, from 95 till 2011. Still, there is improvement, you see, this is the worldwide uh, improvement and uh, it is uh, towards the positive direction, as you see, that uh, Nordic countries, uh, of course, have reached uh, now up to 42 percent of, uh, of women in their parliaments, but uh, you should know that they, they also um, uh, practice the, the quota system. Uh, here uh, you can see um, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, national parliaments, the, the, yes, the uh, percentages uh, in, in the 27 EU countries and uh, Malta is um, Unfortunately, now on, on uh, in the lowest, and, and I'm afraid Cyprus as well, as was mentioned uh, just earlier here. 
Um, so I don't know if it's uh, you can see it from the war far, but um, here it's uh, this slide shows uh, the women ministers in EU 27 governments. The average is um, 26, 27 uh, percent. Yes, okay, I will just uh, make it very short. So this is the development in the European Parliament uh, since uh, 79 when the direct elections, first direct elections started. Uh, well, and the European Parliament is uh, higher than 20% um, than, uh, than, uh, average of the national parliaments. It's, it's, a, it's a quite good, it's a 35%. Uh, and uh, Estonian delegation, I'm very proud in this uh, respect. We have 50% women, we are six people representing Estonia and uh, three of us are women and we all belong to the liberal group there. <laughs> so, uh, and um, without any quotas, by the way. So, <laughs> so and then the, this is my final slide here. You see that, um, again, that how many women are in high level positions uh, out, uh, outside of the world uh, statistics. All right, I just concluded. I already put the last file there saying thank you very much. <laughs> and I will come back later this evening for, with a more comprehensive speech. So. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, it was very short, but uh, you were able to summarize in a very short time uh, the situation in your country. Now we are going to be the host of Madame Correllas. <laughs> well, no, downstairs. Uh, it is the reception hosted by Honduras. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Now we invite you downstairs. It, it is downstairs, isn't it? Downstairs, we are going to uh, to be received by the Honduras Embassy here. <laughs>